So my diodes came in. And I've just uh, got them temporary in with some test leads that Mark sent us a long time ago. I still use them all the time. Um, but I just wanted to test both sides with test leads before I solder them in, just to make sure it's right. And as you can see on these, they have... I'll turn that light off. Get rid of that so you can actually see. But you see that gray band? That's basically like the arrow. So think of it this way. That gray band, that's the wall that electric has to come up against on this side. So it, all this electric can flow on this side over, but it can't come back. The printing is so small. I used to be able to read these very easily when I was younger. Now I struggle. Anyways, I'll cut these down a little bit because I don't want them that long because it's too much to deal with shoving inside that tube with all that wiring. So I'll cut them down, solder them in. Deoxin heat shrink. So I took uh, these duckbill pliers and I hold the ends of the two resistors, the resistors diodes together, and then twist the ends. That way I didn't deform or crack this insulation around here before I started to solder it. Then I soldered it in, got a deox. So I'm going to put two layers of deox here, put one layer of the small here, one layer of the small here, insulating each individual. Then I'm putting one large over top of all of it. So Hopefully it should turn out okay. I'm just testing side to side, make sure everything's still correct. I didn't make any mistakes. Many people have mentioned in the last video of this wiring that I should get an M18 heat gun. I mean, I, I understand that, you know, a lot of people skip around, but I mentioned that three or four times that I had thought about it and that I actually went ahead and ordered it. So I have one on the way. Um, so I won't be using lighters anymore. If the M18 heat, the heat gun works anything like everything else Milwaukee, I shouldn't need to do this ever again. But I'm going to get all this done well on either side. And I did shorten the leads on these diodes just so it wouldn't be so congested inside here. Okay, let me finish this up. So I just ran my second, my single over on this and I overlapped that just slightly. And got it good and tight so now we're ready for the final which will be this one which will do all of it and keep it nice and tidy and neat hopefully okay there's our last layer so now we'll just tuck this up in here ever so nice and neatly and gentle i'm gonna let this cool down because it while it's warm it's still pliable and you could damage it so we'll let it cool down real good then we'll stick it in then we'll move to the front because that'll make the back of this thing complete now that the rear is all buttoned up, the next step is I need to isolate the side lights here. All of these lights I have going down the side, I have them wired to be a marker light, which is a one uh, function and one brightness, and then also as a turn signal. So when they're used as a turn signal, if the marker lights are on, they'll get brighter as a turn signal. So the whole entire, entire side of the trailer is going to light up as a turn signal. Now... Traditionally, in trailers, the way they're wired in vehicles today, the back of your truck has a 7-pin or a 4-pin. And on that, you have three significant wires as far as what we're talking about here. One is going to be the left turn, which is yellow. The other one's going to be the right turn, which is green. And then you have the brown, which is your marker lights. So your tow vehicle, because most trailers are pretty standard, you turn your left turn on, it sends a signal down the yellow wire that goes to the back of your trailer and that yellow wire will turn on your turn signal or your brake lights depending on what your truck is doing and it's all in the same wire because you're using the same filament in an incandescent or the same diode in an led now what we want to do is we want to separate that we don't on the back here i want my brake lights and turn signals to work on everything back here but i don't want the brake lights to come on up here imagine if you're going down a road and you hit the brake lights and then both sides of the trailer just get real bright it could cause some confusion maybe scare some people plus just look weird so we're going to isolate the sides to be turn signals and marker lights only with no brake lights and that's it's not as complicated as it sounds uh, there's many com companies out there one is sequent towing sequent towing owns draw tight hidden hitch and reese and they make 
uh, converter modules. This one happens to be made by Kurt. This converter module is something that takes a, a brake light and turn signal input for one side and takes the brake light out of it so that you can separate your brake light and your turn signal. And when you look at these, you have to be careful because many of these modules are the other way around where you have a tow vehicle that has a brake light on the truck, the back of the truck, and then it has a different turn signal that turns on even when your brake lights are on the turn signal and that side keeps working. Most times those are the modules that you'll see. So you have to be careful when you're looking at this. We want the other way. And the reason, the way you can tell, if you just look at the, the way it's labeled, you can see here this says input. And this side's output. So the input has the right side stop and turn, a ground, and the left side stop and turn. And then it takes that signal, splits it, takes the brake light off of the green and the yellow and isolates it on its own signal, its own line. So in our case, all we're going to do is take the inputs here, wire everything up, and we're just, we're not using the brake lights. We're just going to use this one and this one to feed our lights down the side, which we have run a completely different wire for just the side ones. So we will effectively be separating just through this small module. And this was like, I want to say this was under 20 bucks. I'll put a link in the description where I got it. It came from Amazon. It's cheap, you know, and we're not going to put it outside. We're going to put it inside a box because I don't want this out in the weather. I mean, it's, it doesn't look to be watertight. I didn't look at the instructions. It's just good practice. We have a toolbox going here. We'll put it in the toolbox, but that's how we're going to isolate that. So it's not a big trick or some, some voodoo magic. It's just an electronic module that's able to take that signal out and convert it and isolate the two of them. So pretty simple. That's the next step. I have to get the toolbox installed before I can do this. So I better get at it. Well, I started working on this and I realized I got to get the winch in place before I can set the uh, toolbox in place before I can do the rest of the wiring. So here we are. I bolted the winch on then I looked at that motor and I thought, I'm not going to paint that thing. I'll just go ahead and bolt it down. I guess I was wrong. <laughs> So it's been a few weeks now and I'm getting back to the trailer project and the first thing I need to do is get my winch cables made and, and terminated and brought into this toolbox to, to the control solenoid right here. This winch has three posts on top that can be powered and depending on which way you send power dictates which way it, it turns. And there's a ground terminal on the bottom. So we need to get those three need to come inside here so we can terminate it on the solenoid. I wanted to put the solenoid on the back up high so it wasn't going to get damaged. I didn't like the idea of it being on the bottom, but I just gave in and put it on the bottom because I realized how much other equipment and electrical stuff I was going to have in here. This is the best protection, so I'm going to make a false floor. We're going to put a stringer here. A stringer over there and one in the center probably and we'll put a false bottom in here so if we ever have to service any of this we can pull the straps out and the ratchets and all that gear that's in here and uh, we just pull the floor out and get to it real easy because this was going to be a little bit more cumbersome and I think this is going to be cleaner so I was going to do just an Anderson connector if you're not familiar they use them on like forklifts they're kind of they make them in a, a high amperage setting so uh, spec so that it would hook onto here and basically give me a, a male side and a female side connector you could snap together and then the other end would have jumper cables that would go to your tow vehicle and that's how we could run the winch because we're not going to be tow winching anything on here that's going to need the capacity of an actual battery in place and I don't want to put a battery in here on the trailer permanently because guaranteed we're not going to use it enough that when we do go to use it that battery is probably going to be aged out, no good, doesn't work, won't take a charge, any of that crap, and I just don't want to deal with it. So we're going to put the Anderson connectors on, so we have to have a ground that comes out to here and has to come in here. In that floor, I'm just basically going to make a relief where the Anderson connector will lay underneath the floor, and if we need it, we'll just lift that up, bring the Anderson connector up, and plug it in. We'll keep the jumper cables in here, and you'll see that in a little while. 
But I'm also going to do something else. I'm going to run a positive and a negative up here, and I'm going to build a tray to hold a Group 31 stud post battery. That way, if uh, we're going on a long trip, and we know we're, you know, we're going to, we may be using that winch, I can just grab a stud post battery from the shop because I always have some laying around, put it in place, you know, put the tie down on it, connect the terminals. Away we go. I don't have to have a dedicated battery for this. Group 31s are plentiful around here. And a lot of times I replace them, not because they're bad, but just because of the age. And, you know, when you need three batteries to start a truck in the cold weather, I don't want weak batteries. They're just not strong enough for that, but they're plenty strong enough for stuff like this. So uh, I think that's the plan. So what I want to do next is get all the cables that go to the winch. I want to bring them out the floor. I got to do my layout for all my holes, get them drilled, and I have to make the cables. This didn't have cables, so I got to make some to fit on this. All right, so I've chosen some cable here, and when I'm choosing cable, I just don't grab whatever we have. Um, I hope I have what I'm looking for, and I usually do because we take enough junk apart and keep enough junk, but uh, this happens to be number two copper stranded. And you can see how many strands are in there. It's a fine wire, not a coarse. So meaning uh, fine has more strands in it. The coarse would have less strands. Uh, this is far more flexible and more suitable for a situation like a trailer because it's going to be vibrating and moving around, stuff like that. So we need to choose the correct wire inside the makeup of the wire. And we also need to choose the correct American wire gauge size which is number two number two will be more than enough size more than enough with a rating of more than enough to run this winch that what we're going to use it for so the next thing is we need to make sure the jacketing is correct and it's going to work and all conductors have ratings on them you just have to find find it and clean them up sometimes but it basically tells you the size of the wire and the insulation that's on it, what it's rated for. And we're looking for something in a uh, damp or wet conditions, which is what this is. So that being said, now what we got to do is we got to choose the right terminal ends because we're going to cut these to length and put ends on them so we can run it from one end to the other. So we need to know what the terminals are on the controller, which are a 5 16 bolt and on the winch is a 5 16 stud. So we know we have number two wire with a 5 16 hole to go around. So I got this kit and I'll put a link in the description for it. This is intended for making battery cables. It really works out pretty nice. And the one we need is right here, which you can see it rated right here. Number two by a 5 16 hole. So that'll allow us to put our number two wire inside it. We can crimp this and solder. And then we can add for each one color-coded heat shrink. Those are all going to be power, so we'll use mostly red. And then we'll have one ground that's going to come up. I don't have enough of these in the 5 16 There's only five of them in here because it comes with five pieces. Um, and then I needed for the battery, uh, those are a 3 8 stud. So that's a number two by 3 8 So we have two of those. Since I don't have enough of these, I'm going to use a number two by quarter. I'm just going to drill that out to 5 16th. So, you know, I'll just be taking a little bit more out of there. It'll be just fine. And that will make our cables. So let's get to it. First thing we're going to do is lay our connector next to the wire and mark it so we can cut the insulation off. I like to use a razor blade. I'd like to just score it all the way around. And then I'll bend it a little bit and see where it didn't cut so I'm not cutting through the wires or damaging. Because anywhere you nick the wires, you create a hot spot. I would much rather clean up insulation than cause a, a hot spot. You can see just how it tears just around the edge. Okay. Now we'll make sure we get enough room here for our conductors. They're bottomed out. 
So when I crimp this down, it's going to push this back slightly, which is okay because we're going to heat this and then we're going to shove solder down in there. So this crimp tool has a dial here. This side is for aluminum conductors. This side is for copper. And you just run this knob in here forward and back until you get it lined up with the one you want, which we want. This is copper, number two. We need to go right there. That's what we want. And I'm using this over the other one I have. The other one I have will crimp a hex. This crimps a point. And that's what I want. I want the point underneath it. So I'll put that in there like so. Set it right here. And press her down. Okay. There's what we end up with. The, the reason I'm using this one over the other one is the other one has a hex like this, and it squeezes it, and it makes really sharp edges on this side on these little, these little terminals. So... Uh, this one you can see pushes in the bottom. Now we can heat this up and throw solder in here and then she'll be a good connection for a long time. So now we just have to do all of these just the way we want them. Got all my cables finished and I've brought them up through here. I laid everything out and I ran it through the grommets. I just wasn't happy with how the grommets fit around that uh, that cable, the wire itself. So I went ahead and got some sealer and put it around it on all of them. And it's not pretty, but what I'm looking for is trying to keep the, the moisture out more than and protect the wire more than I am the uh, the aesthetics of it. I don't really care about that. So we're going to let that go overnight. I'm going to see if I can find an incandescent bulb to put in here and just kind of clip it and let it stay warm in here all night. I've got heat in the shop, but I don't. I want to guarantee this is dry by morning and cured so that I can continue to move on. So I've been working on these battery cables and I was out here working by myself just doing what I'm doing. And sometimes when I'm out here working, I kind of talk to myself and work through some things. And I was like, you know, I, I really probably ought to find some heat shrink in red and black so that I can heat shrink them and you'll be able to see which is which. And you weren't out here. Mm -hmm. You were inside with Jeff the, for the last few days. The day that I was working on this, he wasn't feeling well. And uh, I didn't say anything to anybody. And then today this shows up um it was delivered to our doorstep off of amazon and look what this is oops now, i didn't say a word I was gonna pick it up. about this to anyone and the person who sent this to us is a friend of ours bill speck i don't know how this works with that man but whenever I'm doing something and it seems like I'm thinking about something or I mentioned to you, you know, mm -hmm. that, hey, I probably <laughs> ought to look for some of this or whatever. Next thing I know, it shows up at my door. And I don't know if he's got a hidden camera in here, Bill. <laughs> but it's, it's a little unnerving. <laughs> he's never been here. He's just a thoughtful person. I don't person. know how he thinks of this stuff. It's it's so weird. But anyways, this was sent to us by Bill, so thank you, Bill. Yeah. I don't know how nice. you knew, and I'm a little unsettled about that, but <laughs> grateful nonetheless. So anyways, uh, in the previous videos, I was talking about I was going to get the Milwaukee uh, heat gun or doing my heat shrink tubing. So it's it's here now, and. Um, I got a new battery and a new rapid charger, and I don't have um, uh, unreasonable expectations for this because 
you have to realize that anything that uses electricity to create heat is very inefficient. So, in order for this to make heat, it's going to have an element in here that has to basically short circuit. So when you do that, obviously the battery, it'll eat through batteries pretty quick. So, my intention with this is not to do onesie twosies heat shrink. It's to get everything crimped, get everything ready, turn it on, bring it up to temp, and then heat shrink everything. Because every time you shut it off, let it cool down, and bring it back up, you're using a substantial amount of energy out of the battery. So this is going to be handy because I won't have to mess with the butane anymore. But I don't have false expectations. And I think that's where I see a lot of people talk about this where they're like, ah, it wasn't as good as I thought and whatever. But I really think it depends on how you're using it. If you're going to turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, you're going to need batteries. I got a five amp hour battery. I'm probably going to use this with a six or an eight. I imagine I have a 12 as well. But, uh, you know, just to make things simpler. But we're going to use it because I have, I have to terminate these two battery cables yet. These two are going to be for the group 31 that we're going to put right here. So we use this to do that. And I've got some more terminations in here. Um, this is a rapid charger. I like these because um, it is faster and it'll do the M12 and the M18 both. Um, I don't know. I, I think I plugged two in at one time. I think it does charge two batteries at once. I was thinking about getting that big six or eight bank charger because we're kind of running out of room where our chargers are because we have so much Milwaukee stuff. But we have so much Milwaukee stuff because it's just good tools. That's just it. So I'm bringing my wiring in here now and I brought this cable in. So this cable is coming from our junction box down below and it brings in our turn signal, our left turn, right turn, um, the backup light, a battery charge line, and a ground. That's what we're bringing up here. So we're going to set another junction box in this area and we're going to bring all of our wires in a junction here. So the reason to junction them and not just splice them is one for if we need to add something later. The second is testing is so much easier if you have a problem because you don't have to cut anything open. You have terminals to work with. So I'll get a box mounted in here now. Don't be in this we not we This is an old battery too. I used one bar for all that. That's pretty good. I'm alright with that. It's sure beats chasing after butane constantly like I have been before. I'm utilizing this old box because I only need five terminations in here. And this one has this terminal and this terminal stripped. So this is a good use of this box. Even though I complained about it. Because I have two other ones. You did too. Yeah, I did. It wasn't shiny and new. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't doing so well with it. Okay. There we go. Okay, so that's that's those in. Now I got to bring in the other wires and bring them next to it and terminate on this side. Okay, so I have brought my wires in here from the box down below and I've changed that box out because uh, I argued with myself long enough that I won and I put a new one in but I only brought in the signals that we need which is we need a ground in here we need the uh, the backup signal from the vehicle that's towing the trailer we need a left turn a battery charge line and we need a right turn because we have to isolate we need the the left and right turn here so that we can isolate those from 
uh, the brake lights because we don't want this whole side to light up when you hit the brakes. We want to separate them. We just want them to come on when the turn signals comes on and the marker lights. So we had to separate them. We're going to use that module. So we had to bring those signals in to use. We need the battery charge line because we have to we have to charge have po battery positive coming in to not only charge the group 31 we're going to put up here, but we're going to have a battery on here so we can flip a switch and turn on our load lights. So when that battery charge line comes in to here, we two things. We don't want the winch trying to draw the power through here from the tow vehicle. So we're going to put a circuit breaker in line here, a self-resetting circuit breaker that will only let it draw 15 amps, 10 or 15 amps off of this charge line, not a lot, okay? So that if this heats up, it starts pulling more than that, through that charge line, it trips that circuit breaker and you're disconnected. So it can only pull from that battery. That's the goal. Okay, so we got that. The next thing is we have this wire, which is our load lights, which are inside the bed of the trailer. Let's call it the bed. I want to be able to control those and the backup lights two different ways. I want to be able to put the truck in reverse and the backup lights come on, but I want to have, be able to have the truck in park or even disconnected and be able to turn the backup lights on and all the lights on the uh, inside the bed. So I'm gonna put a switch up here. And what this switch is gonna do is it is going to bring power from that charge line up here. And it's gonna make it to where we can turn all of that on in one position. In the other position, it removes power and restores it back to where it's just the backup signal and just turning on the backup lights we're going to do that with the use of a, of a diode a diode is nothing more than an electrical check valve uh, so it lets electricity flow one way but not the other so as long as you have the right uh, size diode a rating of diode diode for the load that you have it will not let it come back and that's what we have to do so and that's just a matter of uh, soldering in a diode at the right place it's not really a big deal we're going to make it so when you back it you put it in reverse the backup lights come on only and if you come in here and you flip the switch then it turns on everything regardless if the truck is in park or reverse the third thing i wanted to do is turn on some lights inside here so we can see our straps. So I'm gonna be running this power and ground up to here because our switch is gonna go in this corner. I wanna be able to just lift the lid, run my hand to the back and feel the switch and flip it and be done. So we have to have power and ground for the lights that are going to go up in here. And then we have to bring um, constant power up. So we need, from here, we need three wires. We need a constant power, a backup light signal and a ground. So I gotta bring those up into here. So I'm at a point where I need to do, I need to get my structure in here that's gonna hold my lights and my switch and then protect my wiring in this corner. And so I have a bunch of this old angle laying around. It's not very thick. And uh, I just used it to put in here to put my lights in. Boy, did I struggle, cause this is so thin. So I held my weld to this, which is also thin and let it kind of spill over to the thinner material, right? And whatever, it'll, it'll just have to do. So it's in here, but it's not at a 90. What I did was I turned it slightly so that my lights would be in the bottom here and shine this way. So we're not just shining straight down, we're spread out this way. So the next thing I have to do is cut in a hole for the switch. And I'm gonna use a lighted rocker. So when it's on, you'll know it, cause it's red. Couple small drill bits, carbide bit, couple files. We got us a square hole. I think it'll be all right. I end up in the middle. I think it's better. You just, you know, you're just gonna feel for that anyway. So it'll be all right. So I use chip guard on this here uh, piece of steel for my lights, and I used a file just to clean that up real good. We gotta wait for that to dry. So while we're waiting, uh, we went ahead and ran the winch cable back in, got it all out of the way. We're going to go get our lumber. I'm going to use 2x10s, uh, pressure treated 16 footers. We have 77 and a half inches in here, and I do not want 
the same size wood and then a, just a sliver in the middle and I've looked at all the different options so I've decided to go with uh, two by tens if you do the math it's nine and a quarter I'm getting nine of them it's obviously way too big but I'll show you what I'm gonna do what We're finally picking up the uh, deck boards for the trailer project. It took a while. Yeah, it took a while because they only had like six left and they were pretty rough. So they had to get a new bunk out. So we had to, you know, wait forever for them to close the aisle off and all that stuff. Man, it's windy. Yeah, but at least the ones that they got out are nice. They're not, yeah, they're not like beat up. So. They're a little wet from being outside, but not necessarily green like some of the boards you get are so heavy and just and then they warp after you put them down so hopefully this one Quite these won't be as bad when they're green and you put them down on the tree yeah we don't want the tree we're going to anyway so probably going to put them in the stuff in it dry for a while I don't like that. We're going to move it. Okay. So we got all nine boards in here, and we've got it sitting on lumber, as you can see. And then we put uh, strips of OSB in between each row so that it can dry out. It's not horribly wet, but I'd like it to be as dry as possible when we go to put it on the trailer. Because when it does dry, it's going to shrink. And I don't, I want to limit the amount of shrinkage that we have because I don't want to have great big huge gaps in the floor. So we're going to let it let that sit. I was going to do this about what? A month ago, 2 months ago. Mm -hmm. We just didn't didn't do it. Didn't make the time out of sight out of mind, but we're going to let that go for I let it dry and then we'll put it on. It's the next day and our chip guard is dry, so now we can finish our wiring. I need to bring from here the backup signal, a power constant power that is and a ground plus I need to bring these up which are what feed the bed load lights so I got to get those brought up into here and then start doing our wiring shouldn't take me very long at all famous last words first light we've got it soldered in this is the uh, wire that goes to the load lights this is the one that's going to go here and end up at the switch I drew this schematic of our wiring, hopefully to make it a little easier to understand what I'm trying to achieve. Um, so ideally what I want is I want to be able to use these backup lights and the load lights independently of each other, but at the same time in other situations. And I have to, it's very simple to do. It's not complicated. It's just, uh, it just looks like it. It really isn't. So. What we want and what is normal is if this is our seven pin connector right here that would plug into our truck. The center one is our reverse pin. So it would come in here. If you put your truck in reverse, it's going to send 12 volt power down through here. This is our frame mounted junction box that we put on the trailer. And then we terminated this wire here. It comes down here. This is a jump over. It's not a connection to this circuit. It just crosses over top of it for the drawing. The 12 volt signal flows this one and to this backup light they illuminate and you have backup lights. That is normal operation for the reverse lights. However, I would like to use these reverse lights at the same time when I turn on my load lights that are inside the trailer. So in order to do that I basically have to take a source and tie these two together. That creates a problem because if I do that, what will happen is I will send electricity back up through the truck 
and backfeed into the truck. And today's trucks are far too sophisticated and sensitive to take the chance of backfeeding anything. The simple solution would be to unplug the seven pin before you do that. But, you know, if people forget, then, you know, it doesn't work. So we're gonna put in safety measures so it's not gonna happen. And we're gonna do that with just a simple way of being able to control the flow of the electric. Okay, so here's what we've got. We have our reverse signal coming into our box. This is that frame mounted box. We need inside our toolbox, we need to, uh, an access to this circuit. So we had to bring this wire into our toolbox for that junction box I was showing you. We brought ground into there because we're gonna need a ground for the lights that are in the toolbox, but we also need ground for the light that's in this switch. This is a switch that's in the toolbox. I wanna have a light on there so we know that switch is on. We also are gonna bring up battery positive. This comes from the charge line of the truck as well as the group 31 battery that's on the tongue. We're gonna to bring constant 12 volts in here. So what we're trying to do is make it to where I can flip a switch and I can turn on these load lights and my backup lights all at the same time. But this is the switch here and you can see how it is. We brought our 12 volt positive in here and it's normally open. If I flip that switch, you can see what's gonna happen. 12 volts is gonna flow back through this line over here and back up to our truck. So in order to combat that so that we can't back feed to our truck, we're gonna put a diode right here. This diode will let electricity go this way, but it'll stop it from going this way. That'll protect our truck. So what we've done is we're gonna have our switch here, our battery positive comes in, normally open. So as soon as we close that, we, we turn that switch on, we close those contacts, several things happen. Power comes here, flows across our resistor, our filament in our switch, hits our ground, it's there constant, begins to heat up and glow and our, our light illuminates. Then it sends power on that line, which we just talked about. This diode here, what this is gonna do is it's gonna let electricity flow this way, back through here, but it will not let electricity flow this way. So we don't want, when the, when the truck is in reverse again, our signal will be coming through here. We need a way to stop it because if we didn't stop it somewhere, what would happen is it gets to this point, reverse lights would come on and it would turn on all of our load lights. So we put a diode here that will stop it from going this way and only let our switch add power and go this way when we want it. And again, we have a diode here that stops it from going this way and then lights up this. This is a very simple setup. It could be done with a relay as well because you're utilizing two different contacts, um, but relays fail, you know, they get wet and whatever. I don't wanna put any more relays than we have to. These are non-moving parts. You solder them in and it's done. Uh, until they go bad, of course. So this is kind of what I'm after because I want to be able to control them to completely different. Now there is a third line in here that I didn't add, but that is the lights that are inside the toolbox. Um, I didn't add that because it just adds more confusion to it. But I, I hope that kind of gives you a look into what I'm doing and why I'm doing it the way I am. But as you can see, two simple little diodes makes it to where I can use those backup lights when I want them, as I want them. God, I hope that was clear. I got all my soldering done. You can see my diode right in there. I'm gonna have to curve these wires a little bit. I don't have a ton of room back here and I don't want these wires rubbing, so I'm gonna kinda twist them this way. I don't think I can manipulate the ends on the switch because I think it'll destroy it, but I'll see what I can do here. Okay, there we go. We got four LEDs in this toolbox, that should be enough to light it up, I would think. And with this switch off, well on we have all those, and we have our load lights, and we should have our backup lights as well. Let's take us a little field trip back here. Yes, okay, so the other one, yeah, I see it working. Okay, so we got our backup lights, we got our load lights, and we got lights in the toolbox. Um, 
Hindsight's 2020. I would do things a little bit different here um, as far as the layout so it's not so congested, but whatever. Live and learn. So now we're going to check just the backup lights. We want to make sure that our backup lights will come on just as backup lights without turning on everything else. And what's nice is we can do it right here because this is literally an extension of that cord. So with this on, we have no toolbox lights. We have no load lights. So if we've done everything correctly, we should have backup lights. I think we do. Yeah, we do. Okay, so that part's right. That's good. So next thing I want to do is I want to get that module in here. But that module uh, has a sticky back is all it has for mounting. So I'm going to I'm going to put it in this area, I believe. So I got to clean this up real good cuz I'm going to bring all the wires in right here, terminate everything here. It terminates to here, and then we're getting close. So rather than use this El Cheapo stuff that they put on the back of here, we're going to use some 3M. I mean, look at thing holding. We're going to use some 3M stuff. This is actually for body trim. So if you can imagine how stiff and how hard it is to get body molding off a car, that's what this stuff is for. So I'm going to peel all that off and we'll lay it with this. This should be better. I wish it was one big piece like that because I would hold significantly better, but I'm going to go with this anyways. Hopefully that will stick better. I already cleaned this up real good. Yeah, I better go over it one more time and I'll stick it in place. All right, I've got that module in. That 3M tape works so good. So the purpose of that module, don't forget, most trailers... You have one wire for your left side turn signal and brake, another one for your right side turn signal and brake. And because we want all of these little three-quarter LEDs that go down both sides of the trailers, we both sides of the trailer, we want those to just be turn signals. We don't want them to come on when you hit the brakes. We want just brake lights at the very back of the trailer and across the gate. That's all. So we have to remove the signal for brake lights on here. That's what that module does. So we brought our signal from the truck and the junction box down below in here. And then we took that signal, tagged off of it, came into the module. It separates it and sends it back out over here. I just use these two terminals here to terminate them because we had them. This is a module coming in. These are the ones going out to the top rail for the three quarter LEDs. We don't need the stoplight, so I just put a little bit of heat shrink on the end of it, and it's good to go. We just It won't short out anywhere. This is another winch line control. I'm gonna put a um, four pin trailer connector here, a round one, not, not the flat one. We'll put a four pin here so we can plug our remote in here. Our corded remote will be able to go clear to the very back of this trailer. But I want it to be able to be unplugged, rolled up, and thrown in here. Um, that just brings me another thought. Anyways, we have a, a second winch control in that back corner that's hardwired. So all of that wiring is in here and it's complete. The next thing we have to do is what's called a false floor. We're putting a false floor in this. I'll put screws in that. We're going to put a false floor in here so it protects all of this. We're going to run a 2x4 up here, a 2x4 up here standing on edge, and a 4x4 four four in the middle. I was going to make this side where it, um, it was permanent and it stayed in place, but I think what I'm going to do is make it in halves so I can lift this side and the remote for the winch can sit underneath there and then have this side where we can remove it as well if we need to get to any of the wiring. When I did this, I purposely set this up where I could use a 2x4 and have plenty of clearance. And we'll use OSB so it won't short out. There's no wood to short out. And then the corner of this will just be cut off. So this is done. All that part's done. Next, I have to get onto this. This is not correct, so i got to fix it, and i got to make some alterations to suit us.
So I decided instead of taking this nice molded cord and cutting this end off and putting on another end, I might as well just replace this. So I took this off. We'll use that on something else, and I'll just get over the, the fact that they're wrong. So I got my spool of wire here that, you know, it's a seven conductor wire, and uh, I'm putting it in here. And since I was replacing that, I put the diode that's going to stop it from backfeeding to the truck. I put it down the, in the junction box down below. Um, and I've used heat shrink connectors on all of these because this is always a problem for me. These, uh, the wires, you shove the wires underneath here and then they get, uh, um, they get wet inside this connector and then starts to corrode and turns into a nasty mess. So I've done heat shrink connectors on all of them. And I don't use the forks, I use the ring terminals so that they can't pull out. The only one I can't do that on is the center one. I could use a bullet connector, but I decided just to tin that wire instead, and it goes in the middle. So I just put some solder in it so we can tighten it up good. Should be all right, but that's the last two connections to make, and we're ready to test this. I'm not going to get concerned about doing my winch control here in the corner right now, or the wood. We'll get all that at the same time, but I want to get this together, and then we're going to test it. We're going to pull it forward a little bit, hook it up to a truck, and make sure everything is what I think it is and what it should be. Okay, all finished, and I've tightened up all the screws again, just to be sure, so now we can close all that up. I don't use deox on here because deox, you see how much limited amount of room we have here? Deox is uh, conductive. I need to find something to put on here that is not conductive, and I'm not sure what I want to use. I'll have to look and see what I can order. So I'm going to put this on, but we're not... We're not ready to use the trailer yet, so uh, hopefully I don't forget. So the end is all finished up, and I made this cord extra long so that if you end up with one of them trucks for, for whatever reason has a 7-pin clear over off the one side, or you have a receiver you're using that uh, is longer than normal and pushes the trailer back farther, we have enough cord. And then uh, I brought that cord up through this little pocket right here but in order to protect that pocket the wire from the threads and all that I put a wire loom clamp down below and one up on top so it can't move and then we can just take whatever extra cord we don't need when we're hooking up it can be just like that and then plug into the truck so it's a nice place to put it like that I gotta get a I have to build a battery mount for this I'm putting a group 31 here I'll do that later I just want to get through this on the wiring everything in here is buttoned up Still waiting on that four pin connector. The female part's going to be right in here. The male will be on the cord that goes, you know, for our winch. I thought about using one of the Hobo Freight wireless ones, but I really believe it'll be more of a hindrance than value because we're not going to use this trailer a ton and we're going to use the winch even less. So. My fear is I put that on there, every time we go to use it, the battery is going to be going to be dead or whatever. And the fact that this will collect moisture is going to be an issue. I'm going to throw some desiccant bags in here as well, just to kind of keep the moisture down on the bottom. But uh, there's our winch all handled. And you remember, we're going to have a, a corded winch that reaches all the way to the back. But we're also going to have this here, which is our winch control that can be done from back here when you can watch what's going on for some reason the winch control doesn't work so all this is handled i'm gonna get all this cleaned up and i think we're ready to hook it to a truck and test it and see how it does see if theory meets reality should have done this inside where it was warmer now i have to fight the ambient heat temperature difference outside and inside. Yeah, the wind's pretty chilly today. I decided to just go ahead and do this. So the wires wouldn't get a little bit of tarnish on them. Yeah. Yeah. 
The heat feels pretty good on my leg, my hand. It sure does. All right, I got the backup in that seven pin now. Backup lights are on. So we should have backup lights back here. Notice there's no load lights on right now. Yeah, that's what we want. We want the backup lights to come on, just the backup lights. All right, take that out of reverse. So if we've done it correctly, we should be able to turn our switch on. We should have our load lights, which we do. No backup lights, no backup alarm. All of our load lights are on, and we should have backup lights back here. It work? Yes, it works. Okay, that's good. You can turn. Well, I guess you ain't turning anything off. I am. So now we want to make sure we have the turn signals separated from the brake lights. Go ahead and hit the brakes. Hold them. No lights on this side. Got brake lights here all the way across. And nothing on this side. Good. Okay. Uh, let up. Hit them again. Let up. Hit them again. You can see that module. Do it again. You see the module just takes a split second to separate the signal. Um, okay, let up. Turn the left turn on. Okay, and right turn. Oh, yeah, that's good. Uh, I think that's everything. I think we're tested. Oh, marker lights. Turn that off. Put marker lights on. Oh, yeah. I'm happy with that. Oh, yeah, I forgot about our little license plate light there, too. <laughs> that's where the license plate will go. Good deal. Okay, uh, turn... Leave those on, turn a left turn on. I want you to see how these get brighter for turn signals all the way up through. And again, we got it from the center over for our left turn. Okay, go right turn. Very cool. Okay, turn it all off. We're done. Um... All the wiring is 100% complete now, so we are done with this trailer for now. Once this is all dried out, we're going to go ahead and uh, install it. We'll do it in another video. But for all intents and purposes, man, the wiring is complete. We're done with that. So now it's just down to the lumber and a battery tray. That would be pretty cool. So I'm going to pull it outside and uh, let it sit. Oh, i got to get my other tire cover on. Oh, I forgot about that. I bought tire covers because I don't want them tires dry rotting even though this truck this trailer will spend most of its life inside um i got tire covers made <laughs> anyways we're done hope you guys enjoyed we'll catch you on the next one we're finishing up with the wood